Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Feeling Seen, the podcast that talks about the movies that make us feel seen. And today we have a co-host who I have been wanting to have this person on this show since this show is invented. And when I found out that the movie that they have coming out was coming out, one of my first thoughts was A, excitement, then B, I want to have this person on the show. Uh, Emma Seligman is a Cassavetes Award winner from the Independent Spirit Awards for her debut feature film, Shiva Baby, which is an outgrowth from a short film she made as a Tisch student at New York University. And now her second feature film, Bottoms, is about to start playing in theaters. I have seen it and I love it. And it fulfilled all the things that I was anticipating for it. Emma Seligman, what else do the people need to know about you before we get started today? Just that I am excited to be here, um, and that was a great, thorough intro. So uh, <laughs> I'm just, uh, it's such a fun concept of a show. Thank you. And I'm excited to get into it. <laughs> well, I've been di- the question I've been dying to ask you, how have things been since April 2021 when Shiva <laughs> Baby premiered on a rooftop in LA in a post- Vax world and I think you guys were either newly out to LA or you were about to move out to LA Shiva baby had premiered and then I mean and now here you are how how's it been how you doing uh I'm good um thanks for bringing me back (laughs) to that memory and that image yeah I had been living with my parents for a year in COVID Shiva baby was supposed to premiere at South by Southwest in Mm -hmm. March 2020, and I that I just left, and Rachel and I were writing bottoms um, throughout the pandemic, and we'd been on Zoom. So literally, when you saw me at the Shiva Baby premiere, everyone was freshly vaxxed and <laughs> like just like you know deer in the headlights, like yeah. just like little children again coming out into the <laughs> wild, and people were starting to go back to the theaters, and it was such a nice little moment. And that I did impulsively decide to move to LA <laughs> on that trip. Um, and uh yeah i mean since then i feel really lucky i i we've had quite a run with with shiva baby and and we went into making bottoms almost immediately after i um you know it was all in the works before you know shiva came out of but course. it's it's been a whirlwind it's 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 weird you know what i mean you don't stop every day to be like wow this is crazy you're just you know you're trying to get to the next thing you're yeah. trying to like get to the next day and, and ask for the next piece of the puzzle that you need um and but here we are two years later so well and i think i've been wanting to ask you honestly since probably wednesday uh after your movie came out was like truly like i've been i was like texting friends about this and was like i hope one day i get to ask emma about this i want to hear just sort of a bit about what was the tiktok like for like that release weekend of shiva baby and that halo of a couple days after where like so many things that I would imagine had been in back channels for months. Then they can get announced. Then they can get talked about. Like, and regardless of what like happens in the field, like there's that, like, it's like, I think it was, I have it down here, like the sixth bottoms is announced. The eighth, it's like Emma Seligman developing a, pro- a project with Adam McKay at HBO. Shiva Baby getting great reviews. It's out after being like COVIDed out of its festival run that it could have had in person. Like, what was that like to watch it all crystallize and like anything that had been behind the scenes or so many things that had been come to the forefront as your movie is being successful and your second feature is announced? I think that it it's like overwhelming, but I think that it kind of is just the way it goes. Like I think directors pop out of the ground like a groundhog once yeah. every two to three years yeah. to like remind the world that they exist and that they made a movie <laughs> and you know that they're making another one. Yeah. And then people are excited and then you go back underground and you go make that next one. Mm-hmm. I, I think the COVID of it all and the fact that it was my first and then second feature heightened that experience a little bit yeah but i already was feeling so dazed because you know at least we were having you know festival success even though it was virtual it was mm-hmm. all happening you know in COVID already so i already was sort of in a weird zone of like is this real is this not real and yeah. and even that that premiere was so lovely but it was like you know in a it was like 50 people or yeah. something like that and it wasn't like a it, we, we didn't do it at a big theater you yeah. know it was a projector screen on like a you know eighth floor 
pool deck area in a yes. hotel downtown LA. Everyone was spaced very respectfully apart. <laughs> and, you yeah. know, we're, we're having a Q&A after. We're like, there's microphones and everything, but, like, the sound kind of diffuses into the open night yes. air. And, like... Then I remember, like, there was a moment where I remember, like, I was uh, exiting and I was going to the bathroom on my way out and you guys were all kind of in there and it was the most concentrated I had seen people in the entire night. And, like, watching the excitement of that moment, just, like, people being talkative and, like, excited in a bathroom, I was like, this feels really nice, I hope, to watch these people getting to celebrate each other right now, right before everything's about to change. Yeah, yeah, totally. And it was. It was, like, a really nice moment and we'd been looking forward to that for, like, a while and... (laughs) I think especially for Rachel and I, you know what I mean? Being separated <laughs> and far away from each other yeah. um, when we're such close collaborators and friends. Like it, that was a really nice moment. And then things had already sort of, you know, like you said, been in the works. Um, and then it just was a step by step process that continued from there. Well, I, I I feel like you're, the character choice you have brought today is near and dear to my heart as I wear my uh, t-shirt yes, representative of the film we're going to discuss. I am, I will say, this is not about me, but I am arguably America's foremost Jennifer's Body Scholar. I'm just going to put that out there. So <laughs> the character that you have brought today, please tell us who we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about Needy, played by Amanda Seyfried in Jennifer's Body. There's Jennifer. Only back then we were tight. Sisters practically. People found it hard to believe that a babe like Jennifer would associate with a dork like me. Sandbox love never dies. We're totally lesbian gay. What? She's my best friend. Uh, Directed by Karen Kusama, you know, written by Diablo Cody, etc. You're the biggest fan and you're wearing the t-shirt right Mm -hmm. now. uh, So you don't need to hear any of this. Um, (laughs) But the the folks at home, the folks at home folks need at home to hear about to this. Know. Well, and, and the lobe clo- closed in such a way when Karin came on to direct the live read of Jennifer's body that was done yes. just months ago with Rachel Sennett in the role of Jennifer Check. So, look, I mean, the Venn diagram of you and Jennifer's body gets smaller and smaller. <laughs> yes, that was incredible. Rachel, I think, found out she was doing that like the day before or something, but I oh saw her God. post about it and I was like, or maybe not the day before, but very, I saw, she didn't tell me. And so <laughs> she either forgot to tell me or she 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 found out about it very soon before. Like, and she, if I found she, out the day before, Rachel found out the day before, damn it. Yes, because I was, I was offended that she didn't tell me. I was yeah. like, you're, I was like, who are you playing? Because <laughs> they just put out the list of the actors and then she was like, Jennifer. And I was like, and you didn't tell me? Um, uh, but um, I think it makes perfect sense. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the world does get that smaller and smaller. And I had the incredible opportunity to meet. I didn't totally fangirl because it was like at a social function, but like I tried to fangirl as politely as I could to mm-hmm. Karin Kusama mm-hmm. and tell her how important this movie was to me. Uh, yeah. Jennifer's body. Um one of my favorite movies. I at that I didn't expect this to happen at all, but I, I went to that live reading and those seat, two seats next to me were empty and just like nobody's coming. I was like, oh, that's weird. This is kind of close seat. I expected like this place to be full. But then like a couple minutes into the movie, Diablo Cody just comes and sits her ass right next to me. Wow. And I like froze. <laughs> And I I was having the best time because it's just one of the most important movies of all time. And th- I was like, do I say anything? Do I say anything? Oh, my God. And then finally, during the applause at the end, like during the ovation, I finally looked over at her and I was like, thank you so much for this. It means so much to us. Like, this is so important. I just really, really appreciate you. And she was the sweetest person. And it was a real, that was my attempt to politely explode with ex- mm-hmm. enthusiasm onto one of the creators of Jennifer's Body. So very <laughs> relatable content. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm glad to hear that. Now, how old were you when you first experienced Jennifer's body then? Because we're I'm 38. This came out when I was in my 20s. Where were you at when this first arrived in your life? I was 14. Oh, my um, God. Perfect. It was honestly, it was it had just come to TIFF and I, I'm from Toronto and mm. I missed it at TIFF, but I think it was, you know, one of those like press pushes where it com- came out like literally five days after. Mm. Um and I remember seeing it with my friend, different Rachel, and I'm 
full full transparency it was like the first moment i i like felt like i was queer and i was like like ever like where i was like uh oh mm-hmm. like of course <laughs> back then it wasn't excitement it was um and and maybe it's still this way uh for some people but uh it was shame i was like what's this feeling this nothing's more scary. canonically queer than queer panic so um like, welcome well then aboard. good okay so that was my first queer panic was watching <laughs> the two of them kiss in this already incredibly erotic movie you yeah know what I mean? up to that um, the movie was already erotic before the kiss that's yeah. not the peak of gayness actually in this movie it's just the most obvious gayness yeah yeah exactly um so that is where i was at that's like the <laughs> sort of emotional spot this movie has for me the emotional oh. and um psychological <laughs> just sort of place <laughs> that this this movie takes up in my brain and in my um queer identity and journey mm-hmm. um and it just happens to also be uh incredibly well directed like um stylized like you know uh just uh, you know visually impeccable yeah. teen comedy mm-hmm. like teen satire um and i think that it's it's rare to see um uh, teen comedy, first of all, with fleshed out, interesting female characters, and oh, that yeah. kind of Heather's like in two thousand and fucking nine. You yeah. bet, my god. Well, that's nice. Um, me, I'm still a little bit depressed about you know the giant smoldering funeral pyre in the middle of town. <sighs> Moveon.org, needy. It's over. Life is too short to be moping around about some white trash pig roast. That's sweet, Jen. You know. I tell it like it is. And besides, you know what? You should be happy for me because I am having the best day since, like, Jesus invented the calendar. Jesus didn't invent the calendar. Whatever. And then on top of that, just have it look and feel like, you know, a true auteur's movie. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, I hate using that word sometimes, but, you know, Kusama is. Like, she really (laughs) puts in every every frame is gorgeous and 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 just delicious Mm -hmm. and then the way that she directs like diablo cody's words like and with with megan fox and and amanda seyfried like just you know what i mean it was just such a perfect like you know combination of of all these forces Mm -hmm. um and ended up being a huge reference for for bottoms um so yeah as you're as you're talking about it as you're saying these things like the kind of like terms that you're alighting upon like i'm thinking my mind about like bottoms 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 like i can see the threads between like experiencing that and then becoming your own writer director later on definitely i just think that like it's not often that it, not only teen comedies with female characters but teen comedies as a whole mm-hmm. or comedies as a whole comedy even bring it there you're absolutely right look good like mm-hmm. look really interesting um and i my dp and i talk about that all the time like there are there isn't enough credit for sort of you know beautiful cinematography and comedies and in high school movies and um this is one that you know really really stood out for me and affected me and and sort of i think changed my understanding of how teen movies can look and feel Mm -hmm. um for an audience and like you know it doesn't just because it's a comedy doesn't need to it doesn't mean it needs to look boring yeah, uh, yeah you know uh you don't need to just focus on the jokes um i mean that opening shot of just like the jennifer's body and then it traveling up the bed frame to see megan laying on her bed like to open the movie like that like every time i watch it again i just sort of like have to catch my breath a little it's just so yeah. evocative yeah hundred percent. I watched this and I was I saw it three times in theaters and I was obsessed. But like nobody knew at the time was I wasn't around as many like movie talking people at the time. I worked at a different publication and none of my other friends really watched horror at that time either. So to me, I was just like, wow, that was an awesome movie that I loved. And I didn't become aware till at least five, six years later that people didn't like this movie. I yeah. thought like, oh, horror fans went and saw it and they liked it. But I get why it doesn't get talked about a lot because like it's a rated R horror movie. Like, yeah, that makes sense. But then when I realized, like, people were defending it, I was like, why are you guys defending this movie? People like this movie. And people were like, no, people hate this movie. I was like, what's that fucking bullshit about? Like, what do you mean people hate it? Like, this, people hate this masterpiece? Were you aware at the time that people, such as they are, scare quotes, didn't like this movie? Or was that something you came to later on? I definitely had an awareness that it didn't do well theatrically. Yeah. I, I was a I was a budding film critic at the time. <laughs> um, Fantastic. And I I definitely we love a film journalist to filmmaker arc. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
Yeah. So I was aware. I mean, you know, certainly like my friends weren't talking about it and my friends and I all were, you know, big movie buffs and loved watching yeah. movies, especially ones that were coming out in theaters and, and, you know, trying to stay up to date with what was out. And I think because we were teenagers, I think I would have known if, it, you know, people were loving it. I don't think I was quite aware at the time of how, you know, especially because we were dropped into that moment in time and we didn't question things as much yeah, yeah. Like how badly it did because of misogyny the sexism and misogyny <laughs> that, yeah. um, and the fact that the movie was marketed, you know, for, you know, Transformers fans, honestly, and yeah, boys to awful at Megan Fox. Um, and when it was this incredible satire about female friendship, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is part of the reason I relate to it and love it so much yeah. and, and how, and part of the reason it, it infiltrated and, and had such a huge influence on bottoms. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, I wasn't aware of that. I didn't, wasn't aware that people hated it for that reason yeah. that they like, you know, brushed it off as this like silly, stupid mm -hmm. horror comedy that didn't make sense. And they didn't appreciate the satire and, and um, you, just how smart the movie was. And also these like male film critics didn't understand the commentary that <laughs> Diablo and, and Karin Kusama were. They didn't understand that the call was coming from inside the house in their reviews. Yeah. yeah. You are never a good friend. Even when we were little, you used to steal my toys and pour lemonade on my bed. And now I'm meeting your boyfriend. See? At least I'm consistent. Why do you need him? Huh? You could have anybody that you want, Jennifer. So, why Chip? Is it just to tick me off? Or is it because you're just really insecure? <sighs> I am not insecure, needy. God, that's a joke. How could I ever be insecure? I was the snowflake queen. Yeah, two years ago when you were socially relevant. I am still socially relevant. And when you didn't need laxatives to stay skinny. I am going to eat your soul and shit. Uh, you only murder boys. I go both ways. So, but you know, it's been it, it it sucks that that's sort of what happened in the moment. But obviously, it's had this huge resurgence, and obviously, Gen Zers have really discovered it. It seems in like a cult it. classic way. Um, where I feel like was it the ten year anniversary? It had some sort of anniversary in the last few years. I I, I moderated the ten year anniversary conversation at Beyond Fest that they did in oh, twenty nineteen, and uh, with Karin and Megan. And if I hadn't had 10 pages of notes, I think I would have <laughs> forgot my own name when I was confronted with Megan Fox and like shook her hand. May I, may I tell you a story, the, an emotional story from that night that I feel like as a fan of this, you will appreciate. For sure. Um, it was like before, like we were, it was people are started like assembling in the wings of the Egyptian theater here in LA, like to walk out onto the stage. So it's like, a, like Karin and her husband are standing somewhere and it's just them. And then Megan kind of like, there was sort of a lot of people around her. They were like on their phones and busying themselves, but everybody's in the dark being quiet. And like the movie's playing and it's the climactic scene. Like it's the fight between Jennifer and Needy. And Jennifer and, and Megan, like I'm in front of everybody else and I kind of look back and there's one person behind me who's just like fixed watching the screen so happily and it's Megan. And she's like kneeling down sort of like on her heels, just like watching the screen with sort of like her hand on her chin, just looking so pleased and everybody's going nuts in the theater because this is a 10 year anniversary crowd. Like this is pure passion. And just watching her watch the movie and experience them loving it the way I always knew I had and the way that I hoped her and Karin could understand that this movie touched people, I just started mm -hmm. to cry. I just started mm -hmm. to cry watching Megan Fox enjoying Jennifer's body and listening to people enjoy it with her. And yeah, that's just me taking space on my own podcast to not let you talk. And I apologize for that. <laughs> no, don't apologize. That is very that is a very special moment to to witness, especially for a movie that didn't get its due. You know, when it came out, um, they deserve knowing. They deserve to know that it affected so many people and that people love it. Well, and and so with with the the needy of it and the bottoms of it coming together, mm -hmm. needy Lesnicky is somebody who would be in the bottoms Fight Club. Like, this is a character who could, like, conceivably, if she has her, you know, she has her fully realized by awakening, 
uh, who wants to go have sex with cheerleaders. Like, this is a kind of stratosphere, it seems like, of personality within her Devil's Kettle High School, who would be among the, like, Rachel Sennett, Io Adebri. Like, your movie is about um, Io and Rachel play two lesbians in high school. They're coming in to, like, the next year after summer, and they have resolved, we are going to have sex with girls this year. We're going to finally make it happen. Rachel's a little more confident about that than Io is. And in, in, it so happens through a series of absurd events that they decide they're going to start a fight club, like a self-defense club, effectively, to lure girls in into an environment where they could get to know each other. There would be like body body contact and they would be able to hook up with girls because then they would suddenly become the cool fight club hostesses. And then so much madness ensues and violence, great violence in this movie. And that is why I say that needy Lesnicky could be a bottoms girl herself. And I wanted to hear from you about the through line of connecting with this character when you're 14 and then making a movie about like the cat, this category of character as our heroes, as our protagonists for your second feature coming out. Well, I think that firstly, I think I, I think I could see Jennifer also being in the club and, and <laughs> yeah. but, but, but sort of in a way where she's like, I don't need like not to hook up with girls. She'd yeah. be one of the people that was. Listen, recruited. if Kaya Gerber's in this club, <laughs> Jennifer checks in this club. Jennifer is actually like a huge reference for Kaya's like wardrobe and um, just, um, I absolutely you know, dialogue. See that. Absolutely. Yes. Vibe overall. Um, and, and, and Kaya was really good at, and sort of embodying that without making it a caricature. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, I think I related to Needy the most. And, and honestly, when, you know, I was asked, you know, when I heard about doing this this show, I was so excited, but it actually took me a while to figure out a, a character in film that mm -hmm. literally made me feel seen that I thought about for a while and yeah. that I thought, you know, affected me. And I was thinking, obviously, about teen movies and what affected Bottoms because, you know, we only write from a place of understanding and, and from, you know, wanting to see versions of ourselves on screen. Mm. Um, and so I was thinking about the movies that influence this and mm. then what I took from. And I think with Needy, like when I watched it, I just really related to kind of always, and I still kind of feel this way sometimes, like being the second fiddle to, you know, uh, another woman or another person mm -hmm. um, that you care so deeply about. Jennifer's here. How do you know? Needy, quit tampooning yourself and get down here. That's fucking weird. Better hurry before she gets annoyed. <clears throat> you always do what Jennifer tells you to do. No, I don't. It's just that I like the same things that she likes. We have stuff in common. That's why we're Biffs. You guys don't have anything in common. Yeah, okay, Jim. I am, I am yeah. the ambassador. I am the Lorax of hot girls. Um, that <laughs> is, I am a needy Lesnicky to my core. So I absolutely understand what you're saying. Yeah, just sort of being the best friend character. Like <laughs> often I don't feel like my, I mean, needy is the main character in, in this movie. Yeah. But she doesn't have main character energy. Yeah. Um, and I feel, I feel, I relate to that a lot and i think at the time especially like i i definitely you know didn't know i was queer mm -hmm. um but i really related to and looking back you know i i can see sort of similarities in like the female friendships i had where mm -hmm. you're so hormonal and you're obsessed with each other and especially when you're in the needy position you're mm -hmm. obsessed with the other girl and you you know want to help her hook up with guys but you like also don't really want her want her to because you're not necessarily even in love with her, but yeah. like you're obsessed with her and you want her for yourself. You and me are going out tonight. Uh, tonight, why? Because Low Shoulder are playing at Melody Lane. They're this indie rock band from the city. I saw their MySpace page and the lead singer's extra salty. Plus, there'll be lots of other salty morsels there for you. Come on, Needy. I promised Chip that I would hang out with him tonight. Boo, cross out Needy. Yeah, you don't want um, that time divided. Like you want that for you. Like it's not a, it's not, it's not implicit in it that that time is meant to be for like no, because I want to have a sexual relationship with you that I don't want you having with other people. It's just like no, I don't want to sacrifice you to anybody else because the world has access to you and like you're kind of privately mine in a way that you don't belong to anybody else. And it's a very specific kind of desire for a person. It is, and it's like you also only want that kind of person to shine on you someone mm -hmm. who has that kind of amount of of power in a room especially when you're a young teenage girl which is like a it's such a weird position to be in when you're like the hot 
14, 15, 16 year old Jesus, girl, yeah. which is like just such an uncomfortable, but also powerful position to be in mm -hmm. you, that energy radiates so much. And when someone like that shines their light on you, it feels so, so, so wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, and of course it feels tied to sort of a certain level of now looking back, like queerness and like, you know, like liking them and being mm -hmm. attracted to them and allured, you know, by them, but, at, but also you just want them to to only see you mm -hmm. and you also want to take credit for their them being so cool like right. you're like i'm their rock you know <laughs> yeah. i'm the, the girl that they like talk to about everything and mm -hmm. that they ask questions about how they should dress and i just love that needy and jennifer are two completely different characters but they're best friends um and that relationship female friendships are so fucked up and i remember like you know megan fox and and Amanda Seyfried, like talking about that, like, you know, there were inherently competitive with each other and mm -hmm. inherently, you know, trying to steal from each other and jealous of each other, even when we're trying to be the most supportive of each other, mm -hmm. even as adults. And yeah, I think that their dynamic is timeless um, in that. So, so, and they're, they're also completely codependent. Um, mm -hmm. And so that, especially like infiltrated bottoms, I think, um, I think in our own way, you know, we're not satirizing the same things that yeah. Jennifer's body is, but I think that um, we did want to kind of make fun of feminism a little bit mm -hmm. and sort of the feminist idea of girls needing to be the most supportive of each other and, and you know, forming a group for empowerment. And mm -hmm. when these girls really just are regular teenagers who want to have sex, like female characters don't need to be, <laughs> yeah. these, you know what I mean, supportive beings that are led by morality. Just um, so virtuous, just virtue yes, to the core. Exactly. Um so that's sort that's sort of like a long winded way of sort of bringing needy and Jennifer into the mix and talking about sort of how I relate to mm -hmm. her and within that specific dynamic. And I also was just such a loser in high school. And so, <laughs> but like near the popular people, that's such a specific yeah. zone to be in. Like it's I was kind of so like specific, you know, like I was like uh, liked by them and I felt so special, but mm -hmm. I wasn't really part of the group and I yeah. wasn't as cool as them. And I definitely wasn't being invited to the same things that they were, but I was like, <laughs> kind of the like liked you know weirdo mm -hmm. you know who was like into movies and whatever and that was my position yeah i i i, I was like I, I coasted like i just i had it easy like but i wasn't the cream of anyone's crop but like i knew a lot of people and i kind of got along with everyone and i remember one uh there was there was a very a very beautiful popular girl in my grade named danielle and like one of those like girls who's sort of so pretty she's a celebrity like she, it's that kind yeah. of celebrity status that you know, she wasn't a bitch like Jennifer, but it was that sort of thing where there's an air about her that's just different. And I remember getting in a fight with my best friend and I it went it went so badly that I like called my mom and was like, can I come home from school? Like, I actually can't finish today. So I'm sitting crying in front of the office at the entrance to the school waiting to be picked up. And Danielle walks down the hall. I'd known her since the third grade. And she sees me crying and she sits down and just wraps me up in the biggest hug. And I, the way that nothing else could have fixed me in that moment, besides being like the the, the girl, just took my side. Like, yeah. she, like it was the fact that it was like they were then aligned. Like I liked the attention, but I also liked knowing that she was aligned with me and that my best friend who was just a jerk to me, she didn't have Danielle on her team. And that mm -hmm. just like changed my whole day because that's the power that that's the kind of magnetism and sort of tectonic plate shifting ability that people like that have when you're a kid and like they yeah. still have it when you're adults but when you're a kid you just don't really know how to cope with it yeah and i think they gain attention and, and validation from knowing that them shining their light on you like is so validating like you can like they can see it in your eyes that them giving you attention like <laughs> yeah you know, changes your whole week <laughs> yeah. and, and it's something that you then can talk to your other friends about. Yep. Um, but I I feel like Needy and Jennifer's relationship is almost a little bit more adult. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's almost more reflective of an adult female dynamic. I think you're very right about that actually, yeah. It's like a little more codependent. It's a little more like you wouldn't really probably see a Jennifer and Needy being best friends in high school, but you see, you know, female friendships formed um, in, in your adulthood where one of them is like, I don't know, like super femme and the other one isn't, or one of them like dates a million guys and one of them's in a serious relationship, you yeah. know, or one's gay and one's straight or whatever it yeah. is. And, and, and their differences help each other, mm -hmm. but are also completely combative. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> it's time for us to take a short break. When we get back more from Emma on Jennifer's body, 
her new film Bottoms and working with her friend, Bottoms star and co-writer Rachel Sennett. Then you'll have one quick thing before I go about some very exciting new programming coming to the Criterion channel, and that is high school horror. So stick around for a little mention of that. I'm Emily Heller. And I'm Lisa Hannawalt. And we're the hosts of Baby Geniuses. We've been doing our podcast for over 10 years. When we started, it was about trying to learn something new every episode. Now it's about us trying to actively get stupider. And it's working. (laughs) Hang out with us and you'll hear us chat about... Gardening. Horses. Various problems with our butts. And all the weird stuff that makes us horny. That's so weird, all that stuff. (laughs) Baby Geniuses, a show for adult idiots. Every other week on Maximum Fun. Baby Geniuses, we know everything. The following pro wrestling contest is scheduled for one fall. Making their way to the ring from the Tights and Fights podcast are the baddest trio of audio, the hair to beware, Danielle Radford. It really is great hair. The Brit with a permit to hit. Lindsay Kell! The queen is dead! Long live the queen! And the fast-talking, fist-clocking Hal Uplin! See, I can wrestle and be an announcer. Get ready for tights and fights! Listen every Saturday or face the pain. Find us on Maximum Fun! No ring the bell! Welcome back to Feeling Seen. Today, I am sincerely so excited to be speaking with Emma Seligman, director of Shiva Baby and Now Bottoms, two excellent films. And Emma is feeling seen by a character near and dear to my heart, needy Les Nikki from Jennifer's Body. Let's get back to it. I can barely contain myself. You've mentioned a couple times, like the 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 importance to you of like like this the friendship story. Like what you have in Bottoms is a is a central like the the central sort of love story of this is the friendship between Rachel and Iowa Debris' characters. And then obviously we're talking about that a lot in Jennifer's body. And and I know when I saw this, like I'm I'm a pan romantic gray asexual, as anybody who listens to this podcast has heard so many times. And friendship love stories are those are my great romances. Like that's what I orient my whole life around. And when I saw this movie, it was the first time. I felt like I had ever seen something that like I haven't had like physical sexual relationships with my friends, but it was the first time I had felt something capture the intensity and the almost like invisible string sort of kinetic link between me and like a, a best friend that I'm just like so obsessed with kind of and like devoted to like it was the that sort of supernatural aspect of it and the care and attention to the messy intimacy that's like kind of violent but extremely satisfying and codependent but like nurturing at the same time it was the first time i had seen something convey that level of acute interest and connection with another person that i experienced in my platonic relationships and so i just fixed onto this movie as something where it's like this movie understands the queering of friendship even when mm-hmm. two people aren't destined to end up in bed together but they are sort of linked to each other in ways beyond explanation that we typically ascribe in sort of like homonormative language around platonic intimacy so it just like changed my cells and so i, I wanted to hear from you about sort of the importance of, of female friendship and really organizing a story around something like that well, what's so interesting, and thank you for saying all that, but what's so interesting is that I, initially Rachel and I really didn't want to ground the friendship or think too much about it because I think we were really sick and tired of seeing female friendships on screen that are overly and unrealistically supportive, sure. um, where that's the only thing you see is just, I think because for so long, female friendships were seen on screen, you know, only talking about men and and tearing each other down and being competitive with each other then there was like a turn and a wave of like yes queen you're the best thing ever and <laughs> you know never let anyone tear you down and, and yeah. you're the most beautiful like amazing person in the world and that just felt so cheesy and so like not real to us mm-hmm. you know um that we didn't want to focus on it and then you know as time went on our you know incredible producers and 
um, the incredible team of women at Orion, like really wanted us to ground the friendship. And and then when Io, who had always been attached to play the role, but, you know, was finally on board. And when mm-hmm. we were in the mix of sort of getting ready to shoot the movie, she also really cared to know about like w- their crazy dynamic, you know what <laughs> yeah. I mean? Um, and why it is the way that it is. And so I feel grateful that we were encouraged by others to ground it. I think okay. we were really wary of that at first. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I think that, you know, like it, 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 we didn't think too hard as we were trying to do it. We were just yeah. like, they're codependent, they're teenagers. And so mm-hmm. therefore they make stupid decisions, you know, and they think with their, you know, hor- their hormones and not their brains. Um, mm-hmm. And um, they want silly, superficial, selfish things, um, uh, but they love each other. And they kind of have this shift in power as you know the movie progresses so i think we ended up sort of having to focus on it because we were getting so many notes on their friendship right. but um we didn't think too hard about sort of like what are we trying to say you know like yeah like, what kind of dynamic do we want them to have like etc mm-hmm, mm-hmm. well and, and how like you know in in like all the conversation we've had leading to this point like this this movie comes from and shiva baby is so it seems like organized around like the collaborative creative friendship and professional relationship you have with Rachel Sennett, who is, I I am so impressed by her as a performer and as a fucking star. Like, yeah. and, and just like, this is somebody who is professionally a star in addition to being really good at their job of being an actor. And I remember that uh, that night at the Q&A, there was a moment where like, I think like Heineken was like sponsoring the event or something. So you guys yes, all had to they be photographed. Were. You guys <laughs> all had to be photographed like with, you know, the, the Heinekens at some point. It was like, you and Diana Agron and her. And sort of at, at a certain point, everybody, it was like a group shot. At a certain point, everybody sort of seated away from the photograph. And then Rachel was just like on her knees on a beach chair serving, holding a Heineken. He was. And just like could not quit and the, like so the photographer just kept taking pay and I was standing next to you I was like wow she was born for this and you were like she's just getting started like this <laughs> <laughs> and it was like wow like just like watching something so naturally effervesce off of a person and I wanted to hear about like that like you know maybe it's like a forest through the trees thing or like I don't really want to talk about it we just get along we hang out it works but like Tell me about, like, coming from Tish to this point, like, getting the chance to make two features with this person, who you clearly have a productive enough professional relationship with, in addition to just really enjoying another's company. That, like, you've made two fantastic films back to back, one of which, like, landed you guys a Cassavetes Award. Like, I would love to hear about, like, sort of the, the that hive mind of, of you and Rachel as you make things. And that, you know, challenging relationship of two women being very close. Yeah. I think it's been... Um... I really do feel like the most spiritual when I think about Rachel and I meeting and I Mm. when I think about sort of the the blessing we've been given each other by having this relationship that's both professional and creative and uh, emotionally incredibly supportive and challenging in all the Mm. right ways Mm -hmm. um uh you know I I, it's not like a forest from the trees thing but it it just felt like fate that that we met and that I met someone as ambitious and as supportive and as organized and um, <laughs> talented um, and hardworking as mm-hmm. she is. She's one, she's the most hardworking person I know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that it's been it's been like such a blessing to have a person to sort of navigate this journey with of going yeah. from making our first indie that you know was a success and 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 we're very grateful for it but you know like that that that's definitely not something guaranteed when you make a movie for as little as we did <laughs> yeah. um and so having a person to weather the 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 highs and the lows together um is quite special and most people don't get it like it's quite yeah. an extraordinary um, thing we've been given. That's a really nice, us. like to to like have the exact same moment, kind of at the exact same time, and like preserve one another's experiences with each other. That is, that's very unique. It is, it is, and and I think that you know, it it just sort of that thing when you, someone is like a sibling to you, you don't stop and check every day, like oh wow we've grown. But but <laughs> when I do look, I do I, I feel like you know I am able. Every time she gets a new job, you know what I mean? Or she books something big, like I'm like, whoa, that's a big deal. This is it's a big a step. Big and deal. She, she's more focused on like, oh, okay, I'm stressed because I have to do this tomorrow and whatever. And but I'm not done this in time. Um, but yeah, I, I couldn't have, I don't think, you know, I, I, I could have done the beginning of my career like any other way without her. 
Um, with the with the needy of it as well, I wondered like, as a as a you know somebody like a burgeoning cinista, a film critic back mm-hmm. when you see this at fourteen, and then now. Do you, like, Needy was a character in how she was so, like you said, she's a main character, but she's technically sort of like, she's the cons- she's the consummate best friend character. She's the consummate side character, but the story is put on her shoulders. And then what Megan Fox does is so, like, world-bendingly charismatic that you manage to make these two co-leads, even though, and Amanda Seyfried is giving such an incredibly delicate performance to accomplish what she does in this movie. And, um, but I wanted to, like, at the time, Needy was a character that felt kind of exceptional, whereas now, like, I feel like we can have a movie that does organize around Needies, and as mm-hmm. Needies of the mm-hmm. world, as, you know, as you, a self-identified person who's connecting with with this character, where do you feel like the role of the Needy as a protagonist is? Like, does that feel like something, like, you obviously got bottoms made, but I don't know, does it feel like... Do you feel like you see from that character what you want to see now? Or was Bottoms kind of an effort to be like, I'm not kind of getting what I want from these characters as central figures, so I need to do this myself? I think that all you can do is create what you want to see. And I think that I didn't have PJ and Josie in growing up, and Mm -hmm. and I didn't have queer teen comedies. um, Mm -hmm. And I still don't think there's enough of them um mm. with with sexualized like real teens um mm. i don't i don't think i think too hard about where we're at like do i see enough of this do i see enough of that i just sure. create what i want to see so mm. in terms of the needies i don't know i i just that was just a character that i like felt seen in, and i don't maybe she hasn't really been done since to the to the like with the quality that was given to her and Jennifer's body from Diablo Cody's writing, from Amanda Seyfried's performance, and from mm-hmm. Karen Kusama's direction. Like I've, I haven't seen a needy portrayed with that much depth and um, uh, just precision mm-hmm. um, and quality since. Well, and and into the you know to the body and and sort of blue humor aspect of of bottoms. Um, I wanted to hear from you about like I I've been talking with filmmakers uh, that I know recently are sort of around in the 30 range. And, you know, like in what you were saying with Bottoms wanting to kind of like take a few like punches at like the idea of like feminism <laughs> and like the sort of hashtag feminism, girl bossy mm-hmm. feminism that has become a sort of bad shorthand <laughs> for how we understand this movement in the present day in a lot of ways. But I wanted to hear from you about like the f- centering of sex as a narrative for women on screen at a time when like, you know, people sort of long for the days of the erotic thriller and like movies that feel like they kind of can't get made in Hollywood anymore. And it feels like we're, you know, we have to sort of rebalance the the scales at this point where we have moved away from a kind of transgression in cinema because it has so many attachments to like kind of the bad old days of not equitable treatment and women being driven out of the industry for not being compliant, but missing sort of sweaty, basic instinct, like animal brain kind of stuff. As a young filmmaker, like you're in your mid twenties. And so I wanted to hear from you about sort of the push to blue humor and the bodiness of bottoms and whether or not that was something like, clearly it seems like, you know, Orion and Elizabeth Banks' company like embraced that. But I want to hear your sort of perspective on that, like like women and sex and bodies in, in movies that, that you get to make or that you want to make. I think it's tricky. And I think like, I agree, we're in a weird zone where like, even when writing bottoms, I was like, are we being like offensive? Like, is this appropriate? <laughs> like, should we like like the scene there is a scene in the movie that wasn't always there and i remember when we added it i was like oh is this okay are the actors going to be comfortable with this because yeah. i feel like as women we're trained to want to make each other at least within the context of making and creating a film with sex yeah. in it we want to make each other feel comfortable um and safe um yeah and i think that like it's tricky with Shiva Baby. I had no problem sort of writing and and wanting to create this sexualized character, mm-hmm. um, but because I could relate to her so much, so I mm. feel like it should always be coming from a place of like I can relate to this. I am in these situations. I, you know, want to see the sort of um, wonderful things and pains and horrors of my sexuality on screen. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that with bottoms, like because it's teenagers. Yeah, yeah, you know, totally. I was definitely nervous to do that. And it's interesting because there is sexual elements in the movie. But when I think about 
you know, sort of the future. I hope that younger queer filmmakers can push it further yeah. and have nudity. We don't we don't have nudity in the movie. And part of that is because we didn't want to objectify the sort of love interest because so many of the references we have for this movie are movies that I love but did objectify the female characters. So yeah, they have like a fast times at Ridgemont High, like Phoebe Cates moment. Mm-hmm, exactly. So um, I think that, that we are in a time of navigating that. And I wish I felt more free to... Mm do that stuff but yeah i will yeah. say that we had no pressure to desexualize it there was no one at um uh you know there was no producers there was no one at orion that was like oh like make it more innocent you know like yeah. they definitely were like if this is going to be a sex comedy for teens you know what i mean yeah like, yeah but, yeah we're we, you know it, it does feel a little um hindering sort of the conversation around like female nudity and and um sex scenes. I appreciate you mid and like talking about the difficulty of that because I I would like for the conversation to be sort of more present in how it's like no this is actually hard to figure out and like it's not necessarily happening how we want to see it cuz we're not we don't know how to do it yet even the, those of us who might be wanting to engage in sort of more work like this. So thank you for for discussing that a bit. Yeah, for sure. Happy and to. so I, I I unfortunately must relinquish you to time, but like I I so appreciate you coming on and talking about one of the greatest movies ever made <laughs> with one of the best characters of all time uh, that ev so many people were wrong about, but that now we get to do the jo joyful work of talking about how wrong they were and just how good this has been the whole time. Emma, thank you so much for coming on. And Bottoms is fantastic. Thank you. And I am so happy that it's coming out into the world. And I hope that you get to take your moments when things are so behind the scenes in this business that it's like your victories have to be sort of like silently celebrated until they get to be loud. <laughs> yeah. So like, I hope you feel like you're getting to celebrate your victories. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for having me on. This was so much fun. Thank you again to Emma Seligman. Bottoms hits theaters the day after this episode drops, August 25. I had a blast with this movie. Um, it has some great brawl for all action that feels like so real. You wonder how someone didn't leave with a broken nose. At least a few people didn't leave with a broken nose. Uh, it's got a heart of gold. It's a friendship love story in addition to a horny girl high school comedy. So please do go support Bottoms in the theater if you can. And Emma's first film, Shiva Baby, it gotta be one of the best first directorial efforts maybe of all time, I'm gonna say. Come on now. It's on Canopy, Hoopla, and Max. And now, the promised one quick thing before I go. Super excited, you guys. Starting in September... The Criterion Channel, its latest featured list of programming for streaming, the theme is high school horror. That's right. It's a horror month on Criterion. And I know that, like, the genre has obviously stepped up in prestige and horror cinema is, gets spotlighted on Criterion. But this isn't like, this isn't like the Australian New Wave, guys. This isn't like the, this isn't some spotlight on the giallo classics the you, no this is movies in a thematic sense that are tend to be put on the discard pile of horror high school horror airs toward the slasher side but this is a list of great films this is a list of like classics near classics undiscovered gems that should be classics and i am so glad to see criterion opening its doors a little bit wider so that we may consider uh, you know, pardon me, but dead teenager movies, body count movies, as part of the fundamental fabric of cinema. Some uh, highlights include, from the 70s, we have Massacre at Central High, and we have Suspiria? I guess shout me out on Twitter, guys, and let me know how old Susie Banyan is <laughs> in the original Suspiria. I did not realize that that was a high school horror movie. We even got uh, Twin Peaks Firewalk with me thrown in there, Slumber Party Massacre, directed by Amy Holden Jones from 1982, which was also written by Rita Mae Brown, who is responsible for the book Ruby Fruit Jungle. This is a 
queer author star who wrote a slasher movie that subverted the tropes of the genre, but the movie was kind of recut and screwed over. And what arrived was not necessarily the intent of the creators. So it's fascinating to watch this movie now with obviously a retrospective lens where we can see the ways in which it revels in the genre and subverts it in certain ways. It's a lot of fun. Get back in there. It's discarded as, you know, one of those trash cult films, but there is a lot of good there, and I dare you to watch it on the Criterion channel. Then teen classics like The Craft. I know what you did last summer, The Faculty. Come on now. Come on now. 90 sleepover classics. Battle Royale out of Japan from 2000 in the um, East Asian and French extreme horror wave that was coming around at the turn of the millennium. Ginger Snaps, Canadian Icons, Gone by 15 or Dead on the Scene, Catherine Isabel, We Love You, Donnie Darko, and Battle Royale 2 Requiem. What a wonderful breadth of cinema. And you know, we get another one in there too that I'm so glad is being heralded by the Criterion Channel. Unfriended. One of... I think the scariest horror movies of the 2010s easy and maybe one of the scariest American horror movies of the 21st century. So yeah, lots of exciting news there uh, in the in the Criterion channel, high school horror. Now let's see it. Let's see it, Criterion. What you're telling me is we are one goddamn step closer to putting, yes, Jennifer's body in the Criterion collection. I know you've streamed it. Um, within the last year, I know that you featured it on the platform. Where is the official release? Where is the art? Where are the essays? Where are the deep dive interviews? Where's Karin Kusama or Diablo Cody or friggin' Megan Fox walking through the Criterion closet and picking their faves? So that's it. What a wonderful send-off, a thematic send-off, tying Jennifer's body into the one quick thing and lionizing it. That's a good day for me on the show. And that is our show. That's the end of it. You can follow us on Twitter at FeelingScenePod or send us an email at FeelingSceneAt at MaximumFun.org. If you want to follow me, I am Jorcru on Twitter. That's J-O-R-C-R-U. Our theme music is by Andrew Epen. The show is produced by Marissa Flaxbart. Our senior producers are Kevin Ferguson and Laura Swisher. And this is a production of Maximum Fun. Maximum Fun, a worker-owned network of artist-owned shows, supported directly by you.